Welcome to the Automators Podcast with your host, Jackie Stook and Joe Glines. Hey, everybody. So today we're going to tell you 10 tips of how to hire someone to automate your work or automate your process or your task, you know. So, yeah. All right, let's get going. Hey everyone, it's Joe Glines here in Dallas, Texas. Yeah, and Jackie here from Copenhagen, Denmark. So today we have 10 points or 10 tips of how to hire someone to automate your work. And one of the first things or the first thing is to have some clear goals, you, you know, outlining what you need, your expectations, timing, budget, stuff like that. That's, that's really a good thing to, to nail down. Yeah, and it, and it sounds kind of silly, but it it's so often you think you're prepared and ready, and you know often they're just they're not. They don't, people haven't done their homework, right, about what they're doing, what you know, especially the like the budget side of things, and t- is the, the you know because one of my first questions when people come to me and say they want something done, I ask them what what's your timeline, right, and actually the second one is what's your budget. Because yeah. those two things right there, you know, if they, they tell me it's $20, I'm like, yeah, uh-huh, okay. Um, or if they want it today, right? I'm like, well, you know, it depends on what you're doing. But normally I don't, I can't just drop everything every time, right? Um, but sometimes people haven't even thought about like those things. Yeah, because expectations, right? It's like if you haven't outlined it or if you don't have a clear goal, what you, what's the end goal? What, what are you hoping to actually achieve? Um, timing and budget becomes so loose because hey i want this to happen but okay i I can use 50 hours on that but are you actually willing to pay that for that or so that's that's a good idea yeah in in later we will discuss the person doing the automation right or the company or whatever but another one that's really critical about that dealing with budget is there are some and i gotta find it um i don't think i sent it to you jackie uh it was a video i saw on on, on coders basically and how you know the more advanced you get like the darker your room gets and the less you talk to other people and the more you don't care about anything to do with money but like you have this elaborate like stuff right and some people like you know the programmers don't think about uh, the cost efficiency of what they're doing and they'll want to take everything to the nines or tens but then they realize well wait a minute like I'm only getting paid X dollars, right? So I guess another good question is, are you getting paid by the hour or just a flat fee, right? So being very clear about that and what you want is critical to making sure everybody is happy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, the the next one going is just, you know, understanding, I mean, it is, we call it RPA, right? Robotics Process Automation. So understanding the processes that you plan to automate. Usually it's not just one. Usually it's a couple things that you're automating, you know, as, as a part of a process. Um, And then, you know, just understanding the programs that are getting used, um, you know, what computers they're on. There's a lot of stuff you'd want to have to know ahead of time because it changes everything. Yeah, because, hey, most of what we do as humans are not something that we actually comment or we don't think about it in the parts of what we are actually doing. But for the computer, actually moving the mouse and clicking a button are two very different things. We're just using the mouse. But to someone actually programming the process, those things are a separate thing. A good automator would, of course, just be able to uh, put those things in. But if you haven't thought it through, if you're just like, I want it to output a PDF. Yeah, okay. But do you enter into the actual portal? Is it online? Is it a stationary program? Do you need lock-in to credentials? Do you need to traverse the program to actually generate whatever output you want it to do? And can the program make PDFs or whatever? So yeah, processes, a lot of things. Yeah, and some of those, this is where it gets a little tricky, right? Some of those things that Jackie just mentioned, I would say you, you might actually wait for some of the very specific stuff for your conversation with the person doing the automation. Right, but you do at a surface level, at a high level, want to make sure you at least have identified the programs that are involved, right? And and that's where it's a it's an interesting balance of because because one on our list later is talking about 
not going too deep, and but we'll we'll cover that one here in a minute. Um, the, the next one we talked about was the access. Like, you know, do, first off, you know, does a person have to be there in person? Can they do things remotely, um, or not even remotely? Sometimes it's, you know, we will connect to someone's um, and remote control their computer with even things like Zoom or um, what's the I can't think of the other big one I would use. Um, but you can remote control and, and you know dial into a local computer for them. But sometimes the process might be so generic, you're connecting to an API and I don't even need to do it from your computer, right? I can write a program that'll work very similarly. I wanna take something from a text file, import into an Excel. I can do all that locally here on my computer. You know, There's no reason for me to travel somewhere because that's where some really huge costs come in, right? And, and everything gets blown yeah, up. And exactly, and that's also a part of uh, the second point, right? The process, where here in, in the third part, part the access, you, you will have processes that you can fairly um, share in concept, and someone will be able to make a script that can do that process. But some things where you actually need to go into something very specific, where it's not um, widely accessible, if it's that one program or that one website or whatever. So yeah, access can be important. Yeah, I, I always love people that they'll post in the forum. Yeah, I'm trying to access this website and you know I'm doing this, but can you help me solve it? I'm like, well, can you tell me what web? No, I can't give you access to the web page and I can't give you any of the HTML. But how will I'm going to do this? I'm like, yeah, I, I can't really help you if I if I can't at least you know look at the thing. You can make some kind of higher firing ideas or concept uh, descriptions and stuff like that, but it won't really help them because that's not why they came to a farm. So, yeah, yeah, uh, totally. So, yeah, yeah that, that's uh, one it, of the hard parts. Yeah. And then, and then there is in reality, sometime, you know, depending on how advanced it is, what you're doing, you might want to have your IT group, um, you know, get, create special accounts for, for the bot itself, right? For this other program, which just allows for you to track down when things go awry, right? Like it's all tied to a given account and it's just much easier to know that it wasn't a human that actually was doing this. It was, you know, a, a bot that actually did it. Yeah, something that I've seen used with the process automation quite a few times. So yeah, yeah. Giving the special accounts, giving them virtual machines or whatever it might be or their own workstation or separate computer or whatever you have the ability to actually give it. Uh, sure enough, that's a good way of also making sure that you no know, humans are uh, interrupting whatever automation is happening. So if you have the capacity to do that, sure, do it. Right, yeah. Now we're not saying go out and rent servers or even buy new machines if you, you know, just because you really think, yeah, well, often you don't need that, right? But if you do have those available, then great, you know, take advantage of it. Yeah, I remember at one point uh, when I was starting out, and my stuff was fairly manual uh, of it actually moving the mouse and pulling windows back and forth and stuff like that. It would be doing that in my lunch break, right? So it actually had the computer uh, for half an hour or whatever uh, to itself why I didn't need it. So that, that worked out for my need at the time. That's an excellent point, Jackie. You could schedule things to work when you're done with work, right? You go home now for the next three hours, that, that same computer, you know, and technically, if you really wanted to, you could just have a different login, right? To the, the computer itself. So you're still using the same computer, but everything gets uh, tracked differently because you've you've logged in under a different person, a user. And it's just, it's, you know, it's a great easy way to compartmentalize this kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the things, this is one of the our points as well, is don't nail down the specific how you want the automation to happen, right? So it's okay to have thought about the process. It's okay to have thought about the goals, um, your expectations, uh, expectations and stuff like that. But the actual how to automate it, mm, if the automator is uh, at another level than you or has another idea or yeah. has done something else prior, uh, hear them out and, and let them come up with uh, some ideas at least. That, that is, uh, that's a good idea. No, spot on. It's funny because we didn't discuss this 
you know, in detail before, but that is exactly how I would phrase that is often, you know, you're hiring someone who hopefully knows what they're doing, right? And they, they have a lot of different tools in their bags um, and they might have a much better, my, my biggest one is actually when people write me and want me to do stuff, they want me to solve something that they've already started. And usually they're sending mouse clicks or keystrokes, you know, to a browser. And I'm like, you know, it, yeah, I don't really have any interest in trying to solve this for you because it, you know, it's, it's not generally a robust solution and it's not the approach I would take. And they don't seem very open to considering a different approach. Um, and yet there's more robust ways out there. But anyway, the point is, which, which I think you nailed it, Jackie, is you can say, Here is, here's some stuff I've done, but just listen, right? Because if they have better approaches, you know, you, you should be foolish to not at least listen to them because they're professionals, right? I mean, that's the whole point of hiring someone. Yeah, and it can fall into all kinds of categories, but sure enough, if, if you're hiring someone to do that small task that you have, or it might be a major task that you have and you have tried to start the automation of it, um, listen to them and try and figure out uh, maybe a middle ground if that's needed. If you're on... Um, mouse movements and mouse clicks and the other guy is on deeper del calls uh, kinds of things or interactions with APIs and you don't see any way for you to maintain it afterwards. Um, sure enough, see if you can get uh, something uh, to the middle of that, but then you'd need to expect it to either be less reliable or maybe changing of the timing or the budgets or your expectations and stuff like that so yeah yeah that, that's spot on i was gonna i was gonna mention that exactly thing when you you talked about the uh you know, it, one of our points later we were going to discuss but i think we just move it up here is the who's going to do who's going to support it over time right and if you're still going to go back to that person and hopefully also like a truck's not going to hit them or you can find someone else that can do it then Having it at a higher level isn't a terrible thing, um, but what, what I'd like to do is say, you know, it is, it's a balancing act of, is their solution better, you know, more robust, faster, you know, less prone to breaking? Um, if it is, okay, can they program it in a way that actually still isn't so obfuscated, so it's easier, you know, you can understand it, or just tell them, make sure they annotate everything, right? And, and it would help. Um, and even if it doesn't help you, when you go, if let's say he does get hit by a bus or she, um, the next person that comes in has it much easier to figure out what's going on, right? That, which is one of those things of make sure that you talk about them, that you want it, you know, annotate, you want it explained, you know, not, does not be line by line, but explained, you know, at least to some level of what's going on inside the code for, you know, anyone else ever. Cause hey, you're paying for this, right? It doesn't take them that much more time to, to make some comments to help understand what's going on. No, exactly. Like, is is your interest in the actual automation, right? A, a finished program that can automate the thing, or do you actually uh, cool. want to uh, learn from the source, the, the code, the actual script that you do, you might get, uh, where you want to look over it, you want to tweak it, or you want to have someone else work on it. So again, expectations, uh, how to do the automation, where if it becomes larger or company is hiring a group of people, yeah, you might not go so much into the commenting on the singularity lines of code, but more on the documentation of how stuff has been done can be a separate thing even. But yeah, I'd say our fifth point of being accessible for questions, plans work closely with the automator. That's a key point because Unless you have video documented everything with your commentaries and expect to be uh, communicating with the automator at a fairly high frequency. Yeah, actually, and, and, I, and I feel funny because you keep saying stuff. I'm like, yeah, I, I was about to say that uh, because I was actually going to say, let's tie that part with the previous one because you made a point about if you wanted to level up Right, it's a great opportunity. Jackie and I discuss this a lot on our other podcasts and, and, and webinars. 
learning auto, any sort of programming thing is much easier when the example you're working on is something you're used to. Learning something, let's just pick uh, regular expressions, right? If I randomly look on the form and try to learn regular expressions and I'm not familiar with the text that I'm parsing, it's, it's much more difficult than if it was an example that I'm actually familiar with, right? So if, if you have a project you're working on and the, the person that's working for you is actually a little more advanced than you, because it's your project, right? You're familiar with the, in the answer of what's happening. It's a great opportunity to, to learn even more. And so um, for that half of the thing of the um, be accessible first questions, I think it's a great thing to like, you know, partner up and say, do you mind if I, you know, sit over your shoulder and, and ask you questions as you're doing stuff? It's been some of the ways I've leveled up like crazy with watching people do stuff on my code, right? It's a great thing. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I'd say exactly the same thing has happened for me time and time again. One of the most recent ones was I've never really gotten into using GitHub before. Uh, now I've been using it for a few months. And the, the final push for it was, of course, having a freelancer who thought that that was the best way of working together. But also the actual uh, very few startup meetings we had where instead of actually working on my process or my, my project, it became some working sessions of actually uh, teaching um, how to use GitHub and stuff. So that, that was some great stuff for me, at least, of actually sitting there, getting all the intros, and then being able to pick it up from there and move into actually using it. So. I'd been struggling with making that final step for quite some time, but within two hours or something over the course of two days, I was up and running. Yeah. 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 yeah and, and that's where having someone who actually knows what they're doing that you can occasionally ask questions to, uh, it's, it's night and day, right? It's like, oh, it's such a, such a game changer. Uh, now, the second part of it is, as, as, as Jackie and I know from doing this for a long time, um, no matter how good the person is that initially worked through and said, hey, what's our goals and what are we going to do? There's constant things that you have to account for and plan around and solve, right? And it's, and if, if you don't have a good relationship or a connection to the person doing the automating, they might go with the wrong, not the wrong way, but a way that you didn't really like. And the, the more in touch you are with them and having quick conversations about what about, what would you want here? It doesn't have to be, you know, five times a day. It's just touch base with them about small, you know, earlier. And you don't suddenly find yourself with something that you're not happy with, you know, way later. Right. Yeah, but I've, I've had exactly that experience of actually being too unreachable or unreachable uh, is the right. So not being accessible enough because it will halt the automator or the hired person's uh, process because right. Right. If they have a question for you and you're the one paying for it and you're not accessible to answer it, they'll stop. And that makes total sense because it does. you Absolutely. don't want right. them to be right. working yeah. by, while you're paying them yeah. and then finding out that it's not what you wanted. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, Which gets back up to earlier, you know, and this is when, you know, because I, I hire people to do stuff for me, right? And, and, and they know... I'm pretty flexible overall, but I don't tell them how I want the thing solved. I outline the goals of what I want to get done. And usually I'm like, I don't really care how you do it, right? Like I trust you, I'm hiring you because you're better at it than I am in the first place. You know, I might weigh in on something, but usually it, it's like, I'm gonna go with what they recommend, right? Because I trust them that they are they know what they're doing. Um, but the thing is I, I work with them a lot and they we have a relationship where they know also, and, and again, it's like, well, I might go an extra day, right? I don't talk to them. You know, I, I, I talk to them several times a week, right? It's not two weeks of not talking to them and suddenly you get this thing and you're like, well, crap, that, you know, you spent way too much time on this that I don't even care about, right? And there's this other stuff um, and that can happen. I think that's some, some of the things, I, at least I know from uh, my country, when, when, IT process pro projects become too big, uh, you know, a big government contract of something where where there's too many 
interests. They are trying to to do too many processes. They are trying to cook together or whatever it is, and it it ends going way over budget and doesn't work correctly and who knows whatever. And it's because you have some people who have been told this is what we want, and they're scrambling to give you that, but they don't have access to that actual user or they don't have that day-to-day -day interaction with the ones who are actually supposed to use it because the project or the description of what they need has been delivered. And then months and months go by where they're just scrambling, coding, typing, whatever, and they're way off base or whatever it might be, right? So, yeah. Um, we have point six as well which should you automate 100% of the process uh, where you put in probably not. At least don't always start with that. Right? It, it's like, sure enough, one of your goals or your expectations on the long haul can be to have it 100% automated, but it probably isn't the first thing to go for. Uh, I know at least from back when I was learning, it was the matter of actually moving information from here to here or storing it in a useful manner so I had it easily accessible or um, all those things. So the lower your skill level, you will probably do this automatically. You will automate small pieces of yeah. the process. And as you work through it, you'll tie those together. Um, and that's something you could do in almost any process or any project. Yeah. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. 100% agree. Uh, but, but, you know, because uh, it's just, it's also, I agree with what you said, but the starting off small, getting it, you know, getting things kind of working here and there and piecemealing them together later, combining them. However, again, the question is, should you, you know, depending on how complex the process is, should you try to automate the entire thing? And that to me just gets back to, well, what are the costs to actually automate the entire thing, making it work entirely without a human, you know, reliably at hundred percent of the time, like it can be really, really expensive versus getting it close can be, you know, 15% of that budget as opposed to if you try to automate everything and have it where nothing ever needs a human to ever look at it, right? Like it's, yeah, it can cost a lot of money to do that last little bit of automation can cost a lot of money. And so I, I try to, you know, I, I don't want to say I discourage it because, because of course on simple things, it can be a hundred percent, but <laughs> the more complex a task is and the process and how many things you're doing, the harder it is to get everything to always work, you know, 100% of the time with everything. Yeah, but as, as you said yourself, if you're not going to automate it 100%, and then maybe with the first point, the clear goals, the outlined expectations, or the, the second uh, point, identifying the process, the programs used, and, or the access, the third point, and stuff like that. If you go through those uh, in a, in a well um, uh, timed manner, mm -hmm. the chance of you figuring out that, oh, it, it's this one thing, 40% in here, where I actually need to go to the web page and go right. to that page and fill out that stuff and click that button and then it downloads the thing and then I can continue. If, if that's maybe one of your pain points, maybe just hire that or right. get that automated. Exactly. And, right. and yeah. Yeah. To that? your point, if, if it, if it, the logic that you're going to use after you make that decision of which one to click, you know, if that was going to be, if you were going to try to automate that logic, if that is what would take so much time, then let the human do it. Right. But yeah. make it very simple for once they make that decision, then the rest is automated. Right. And, and yeah, I think that's a really good point, Jackie. Yeah, absolutely. So if we go into the seventh point, having realistic, uh, realistic expectations, you know, budget, there's always ex ex exceptions, right? So um, there's always exceptions. And 
head on a board or however you put that phrase, there is. And if we, we talked about just earlier today that even with the most simple things, um, because something can happen, there can be something wrong with the hardware, something wrong with software, some kind of ex, uh, unexpected uh, exception somewhere in the code that you're never told about, or whatever it might be, a file is locked, uh, someone else has accessed it, uh, you've lost whatever your internet connection. It, all right. kinds of stuff so many things. can yeah. happen. So if you at least have some kind of realistic expectations, both to the pro budget, because if you want the 100% of the big thing, your budget is it's hard to guesstimate at the beginning, right? And as you move on, you might get a better idea of it. And if you're hiring someone on the hour, sure enough, it will be even harder to know what it will end up costing. Um, but with, um, the, with always keeping in mind, there's always exceptions. It can be any kinds of things. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, and just to clarify, because we, we moved up um, the, uh, who will support the automation? That was actually number eight, not number seven. Um, just because so, we're going to run out here in a minute. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, I, I totally, I mean, there's just, there just always are, there's always exceptions, right? It's just, yeah. uh, it's just going to happen. Um, it, and actually to your other um, point there, not that we really need to dive into this, but it is a really interesting question of, should you try to pay by the hour or for a project? Um, and I would personally much rather always try to pay people by the project um, because by the hour, it's really unfair if people have already developed a lot of stuff on their own time, you know, have these libraries and you're going to rely on them. Like, you know, you'd have to be then, but then you don't want to feel like you're paying them a hundred dollars an hour or whatever it equates to because you're using leverage they already have. Right. Um, it, it could also be very misleading that you think someone is a deal at $5 an hour or $10 an hour when someone who's actually much better and, and, and more advanced and more reliable, they quote unquote, if you work by the hour, they charge more, but in reality, they'll get it done in so much faster, right? That it's, um, it, 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 it's hard, of course, to also say, well, here's how much time I think it's going to take because of the exception things. And it's kind of a, it's a big question mark as far as on some of these things, how long it will take to do stuff. Yeah, and I, I know it from sitting on the other side of, of the table of being the one automating. Um, it's encouraged, or that's what I was reading and heard and stuff like that, talked about with people. For the most part, go for um, the, the price on the project, right? Try and guess or do a ballpark figure of how much will I actually use uh, time-wise on this. Uh, maybe uh, put a little extra in there because there's always exceptions. Right. Um, and go with that. And in a few different cases, go with uh, on a budget. Um, but just because you'll know how long you actually have to work on it. And sure enough, reach out to whoever hired you if you can uh, manage it in that time, figure something out with them. But Within reason, because as you advance, you can still charge for uh, the same amount of time for that given project uh, or likewise project, but use your prior ex take or experiences and actually make even more per hour than you would be able to do by actually telling how much you were charging per hour. Which is the, the, the other thing, which is to me, in, in I don't know if you would say it's unethical or not, but some people, like let's say someone says, well, I do want you to charge by the hour and I'm only going to pay you, let's say it's $10 an hour, right? Um, they don't know how long it takes me to write programs, right? Right. And if, and if I have code that I've developed for the past five years, and as far as they know, I wrote all that to solve the thing, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of ludicrous because unless they're on site and you're only paying them for the time they're there, you just have no real idea of like how long it takes people to do stuff. Um, and, and 
Jackie and I, because he's it's the same, you know, we'll I'll watch people, you know, I'm okay, I'm I'm decent and and I can do stuff in the time order. But I see some people that are like insanely good, like Jackie. And I'm like, that would have taken me a week, you know, and you do it in a, in, a, in 15 minutes. Um, I mean, it's it's crazy, right? Like to think that you can really have a just an understanding of how long it's going to take someone to do something. Yeah, and it, it's no different than asking for a quote, right? So, so right. if you're getting the plumber over and he says, oh, this is just what am I going to do with that? Um, you're just not telling him, just go crazy. Right. Uh, I know it was a small leak, but yeah, changed all. That's fine. You use however long you want. No, you're probably going to talk with him, get a fair idea of how long he needs to use on it and whatever ballpark price wise will end up. It's the same for coding, right? Sure enough. That's, that's the way to go for it. Yeah. yeah and those that, that was, I, and I don't know if I mentioned that, that was our, our, our number nine with the skills of the automator doing the automation. I think that tie, you know, was all relating to that. Um, it, but what I would say is make sure, depending on the topic and what you're doing, you do find someone, you know, you need to have a little knowledge. And that's where, honestly, I'd say reaching out to people like, like me even, where I'm not necessarily a great programmer, but I have an, a really good understanding at like how complex things are and what, you know, what approach you probably want to take. Um, because if, if and I know Jackie mentioned this one time in a previous podcast with, with people at his work and the person actually doing the work, they, you know, even though they work at this really big company and should really know their stuff, they, <laughs> I don't want to say drop the ball. Like they gave up really early in a process. Yeah. Um, when like Jackie's like, um, yeah, there's, there's ways to do what you know, he's saying. We can't do this, but we, we yeah, trust me, we can. Um, and, uh, and the problem of course is, and this reminds me cause my background is I'm a data scientist, right. And in statistics, people have no clue, like, how, you know, how to use statistics and to how to hire people that know statistics. And I, I used to interview people, um, people wanting a job in statistics and the vast majority of people come in. I could tell in about three minutes if they had a clue or not of what they're doing. Right, just by asking a couple questions, but the average person has no idea how to ask a question and understand the answer they get back. I think programming, in a lot of ways, is very similar. Right? It's like, well, have you done something like this before? Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've not looked into many coding jobs and stuff like that, but I do know that that bigger companies who are hiring actual programmers, coders, whatever. Their onboarding process actually often includes some kind of a skill yeah. based uh, test, right. right? Just because it doesn't really make sense for you to come in and claim all kinds of stuff. They actually need to confirm in at least some manner that you're able to do the stuff that you, they need. Whereas with, with other things, you coming in, let's say you're a carpenter or whatever skill you have, they'll probably hire you face value. And within two hours of you working, they'll be able to see right. <laughs> that guy. He can't, can't use a hammer right out with him, right. but with a coder, he might actually have a time frame of weeks before he actually needs to deliver something final. Um, and you won't have the, the, ability to look him over the shoulder in the same way so yeah the onboarding is uh, different yeah so it actually i hadn't thought of it but um i just in it's I, the the video i made a video documenting it and at some point i'd like you and i jackie to walk through it and talk about it but the, the fact that we're doing most of these now audio instead of video that's why i didn't bring it up earlier but i, I recently made a video documenting 17 different approaches with auto hockey and how you can programmatically connect to programs right um and that's when like the a lot of people that i talk to with auto hockey they probably mention like four right three or four right oh yeah I, th these are the things i use they don't realize there's you know at least and there's actually more but i, I listed 17 different ways uh, that you can programmatically connect to programs now i'm not saying everyone needs to know all 17 but depending on what you're trying to do, you probably want them to know at least five, right? Like it, it, you don't want them knowing one is the main point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So 
And again, I was still thinking we were talking about point eight, the skill of the automator and stuff like that. But yeah, uh, point nine, who will support the automation? We, we touched on that earlier. You right. mentioned it uh, quite a, a long way up in the list. But yeah, is the automation, is the source code, is it for you? Is it for your task? We know a lot of people using AutoHotKey, the community we uh, usually work in, are people who are at least starting out by automating their own tasks, their own small work uh, load, um, giving themselves more room, building their skills, whatever, and working their way up to automating something more or less important for whatever company that they're working at um, and building upon that. And we know there are people who are doing way more than that. But when you ask for someone to actually write it for you, if you don't want to be able to do anything work for it with it yourself, Mm, then it's probably a good idea to nail down who's then going to be supporting the actual automation because the thing you're automating might change. There might be a Windows update. There might change something else. Or after using it for a few days, you figure out that, oh, it would be really great if it also remembered to notify whoever in, at this point. Right. Mm, okay. Or two days in, you start it and it just doesn't run. What? Right. So that's, that's where it's a good idea to know that this is the person that I'll reach out to or those people over here or I myself will do it. So, yeah, get that one down. Yeah, and, and to that point, I think it you know it gets back to how complex is the thing that you actually are having you know automated, um, and and the more complex, the more expensive. Let's keep it simple. To say the more expensive it is, the more you want to make sure you have you know at least a backup or two of someone that you know they can um, in case something goes wrong, um, which is great. Uh, the other one though, which actually I was going to flip it a bit, is. Hey, if you're not in a, if you're not in a hurry on something and you're willing to be flexible, there's a lot of people who, to your point, like they might actually do the work almost for free, you know, or just as a like, hey, just throw me some money at the end of it, because um, I want to learn this anyway, right? And I'll use this as an example. So it is possible, but you know that again, you may not have the most robust solution done in the fastest time frame because they're not really working for you, quote unquote, by the hour for that project, uh, but. If you're trying to save some money, right, and, and you know someone, it could be a great way to to, to still get you know some of your stuff automated, um, in in reducing the amount of cost. Yeah, and uh, we've talked about uh, quite a few different ways of doing it, up from from you know, the the plain um, mouse events and stuff like that, up to using APIs or um, other advanced coding techniques, but if you're going for that middle ground, not automating all of it, um, you're not going for the highest level of automation possible, um, stuff like that, that also opens you up to hiring other people. If you're not hiring that one specialist that exists for hire, um, right. again, you could probably try and reach outside of whatever language you had the thing written in. But again, you'll probably be limited um, in, in doing stuff like that. So yeah, who will support the automation? That, that's a great one to remember. And then the last main point um, was the, uh, you know, thinking about the data that you're going to have, the person, whoever's doing the automation is going to have access to, it could be very sensitive um, data. And so you wanna make sure you have uh, NDAs, non-disclaimer type stuff, or even possibly like a background check uh, or uh, you know something, make sure you have something protecting yourself. Your yeah, data. again, it, it, if, if you're writing programs or you're selling stuff, or again, stuff like this can be very important. And again, if 
uh, we've had in our webinars a few times where people have come on, shared their screen, gone through the process, and then it turned out that stuff they'd shown to a group of people that was recorded was private information that shouldn't have been shared. So it's okay. We're glad to help. And I don't think any of us really used any time on actually consuming whatever was shown because it yeah. was the automation that was the important part. But yeah, it, it's a really, really good point to remember what type of um, information is the person accessing. It, do you need to do all of these different steps that, that Joe talked about? Um, do you need to com com oh, <laughs> come, oh, come, oh, I can't get the, the word. Do you need to put it in parts? Do you need to compartmentalize? Yeah. Com compartmentalize. Okay, I can't say that. No Fair way. enough. Um, but that's exactly the word I was looking for. Um, because, hey, you might be able to automate that part over here where he isn't accessing the bad right. parts. Right. Um, or you might be able to cut out a piece of the process and say, and when an Excel file, exec, an Excel file exists right. in a folder, do something. Because right. he can get access to the system to download the Excel file. Let the human do that. But you don't want the human to go in and start selecting the file and choosing all kinds of stuff. No, you can instead have the automation actually watch the folder. And as soon as an Excel file with a specific naming convention exists, using Red X, as we talked about earlier, or whatever, stuff like that, thinking about that. So, yeah, or yeah. possibly even creating dummy data, right, for them to be working with. And, and then they don't have access to the real world data. Um, I, I mentioned, uh, I don't think it was during the podcast, but uh, Isaiah and I were working through the mentorship data and we did it on a record. We were recording it because I wanted, is it's a good training video for working with objects. Um, but I realized initially I was using the mentor and mentee's email addresses as the key for joining the information. And then I'm like, well, crap, everybody, I can't have that on there because one, everyone would see everyone's email addresses, which would be really bad. But two, they'd even see what they say that the person knows and wants to learn. I'm like, that's just, you know, that's really bad. So yeah. I just wrote a quick program to replace the email address with a unique ID number. That means nothing. And then that's what's in the video. So, mm -hmm. and because I don't care, I, Isaiah, I trust him. I'm not worried about him misusing the data. But this way, we did everything. Yet he never would know who's who, right? So it was a great easy way to... Um, remove that PMI information in, in, you know, sometimes you could, or the other option would be is maybe you, maybe you know someone at, at your company that you could actually handle that little, and that's what you said about the compartmentalization, right? They can handle this little bit. Well, hey, you know what? I don't have an internal guy that can do this entire thing, but I can use him for the sensitive part, right? The part that yeah. really, you know, I worried about in that way, we don't, like when I was at TI, I had access to, I think we had, I can't remember, it's over like a million email addresses of our clients, right? Like, and I was very, I mean, I honestly started seeding it with fake stuff to see if anyone ever, you know, sends emails to it that someone is getting our list with, you know, without our permission, because I'm just not very trusting, right? Um, but yeah, it, it always concerned me of granting access to that database, because um, I, I was just paranoid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I think that was uh, all the points that we actually yeah. had, Joe. Um, some great ones in there. Hope they're really useful. Awesome, man. Well, this was a lot of fun. I hope everyone, uh, you know, learned something about, you know, there. This, there's, of course, other things you should consider, but these are the biggies. Yeah, at least from our point of view. <laughs> right. All right. Cheers. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. So thanks for listening, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Yeah, let us know what you think. Yeah, we really do hope that you liked what we had to say, and we also hope you want to share it. If you enjoyed that episode of the Automators Podcast, you might also like this one. In today's podcast, we're going to talk about choosing a Windows automation tool or selecting a Windows automation tool. Yeah, now let's do that.